Welcome to the Faith Lift Radio Podcast, where doubt is destroyed and your faith is lifted. Here's today's message from Dr. Glenn. The Lord bless you. All right. Are we ready to have a time in the word this morning? Let's open our Bible, please, to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 1, a very important chapter that I want us to talk about, look at today, the with looking at the indisputable power of fasting and prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, there is power in fasting and prayer. All right? Fasting and prayer are the non-negotiables that Jesus talked about. All right? So let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, please. 1 Samuel chapter 1, and I'm, and it's important that as a believer, you understand the power of fasting. Glory to God. All right. Now... <clears throat> If you if you look in your Bible, please, First Samuel chapter one. But I want to quote to you first of all um, <clears throat> when Jesus said in um, Matthew chapter six, he says, uh, uh, verse three, Matthew chapter six, verse three. But you, when you do your alms or you do your giving, let not your left hand know what your right hand does, that your giving may be in secret, and your father who is in secret, will reward you openly. So Jesus said that God the Father, who is in secret, will reward your giving openly. Then it says in verse 5, Matthew 6, verse 5, And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites, and so forth, and so on. Verse 6, But when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you shut the door, pray to your Father, who is in secret, and your Father, who is in secret, will reward you openly. So the second thing that Jesus said we must do, that we must pray, and God will reward you openly. And then, verse 16, he says, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites. Verse 17, But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that you, that you appear not unto men to fast, but unto your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret, shall reward you openly. So, ladies and gentlemen, we see here three non-negotiables. You can't negotiate this. These are the three non-negotiables of Jesus. Every believer must be a giver. Every believer must be a praying person. And every believer must be able to, uh, must develop on some level fasting. All right? Jesus prayed, Jesus gave, and Jesus fasted. Can you say amen? All right? Jesus prayed, Jesus um, <clears throat> fasted, and Jesus gave. Now, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. So these are the three non-negotiables. Ladies and gentlemen, praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 1. Now, there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim. Aren't you glad you don't live there? All right. All right, now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Eliahu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuph, an Ephrathite. And, verse 2, he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other one was Penina. Now, Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. I need you to underline that in your Bible, that Hannah had no children, okay? Verse 3, And this man uh, went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh, or Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters, portions. But unto Anna he gave a worthy portion. And now if you've got a newer translation, it will say he gave a double portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. Now, I need you to underline that in your Bible. 
All right, because in the days when the Bible were written, they thought that when the womb was closed, it was God who closed the womb. But the Lord had shut up her womb, meaning she was barren. Now, and her adversary, I need you to underline the word adversary, also provoked her sore for to make a fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And so she was mocking Penina because she was uh, having babies uh, all the time. And because Hannah was not having any baby, Penina was mocking Hannah. All right? And she became an adversary to Hannah. Verse 7. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Penina provoked her. Now look in your Bible, please. Therefore she wept. Therefore she wept and did not eat. By the word, did not eat. Write the word fasted. Write the word fasted. Then said Elkanah unto her, her husband said to her, Anna, why are you weeping? Why do you not eat? On the line in your Bible, why are you not eating? Why are you fasting? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in the bitterness of soul and prayed and prayed and prayed. Notice she was in the bitterness of soul and began to pray and wept sore. And she vowed a vow. So we see the three things that Jesus talked about. The three non-negotiable. Prayer. Fasting. And giving. Now being applied by Hannah. She fasted. She's praying. And now she makes a vow. She said a vow to the Lord. O Lord of hosts. If you will indeed look upon the affliction of your handmaid. And remember me, and not forget your handmaid, but will give unto your handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord. Can you see that now? She activated what I call the unbeatable trinity. The unbeatable trinity are the three non-negotiables. Prayer, fasting, and giving. Everybody say, that. Everybody say after me. The three non-negotiable that Jesus told us was we must pray we must fast and we must give all right now what did hannah do hannah fasted hannah prayed and hannah gave to the lord her son all right praise god now look what the bible says and uh, but you will give unto your handmaid a child then i will give him unto the lord all the days of his life and there shall no razor come upon his head. Verse 12, and it came to pass as she continued to pray. As she continued praying. As she continued praying. I need you to underline that in your Bible. And then in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2, the apostle Paul says, continue praying. Continue in prayer. Continue in prayer. Glory to God. Okay, now. I want you to write this down. We've got a number of things to write down today. I'm going to take you on a journey today that will, that will bless you. Praise God. Notice that Hannah had a pressing need. What was a pressing need? She was barren and she really wanted a child. She needed and she wanted a child child but she didn't have a child now the other woman penina she had all kind of children and to make matters worse uh, penina was mocking her so anna not only was she barren but she became the object of mockery i want you to note that but being in a dire situation what did she do she went before the lord and when she went before the Lord, what did she do? She began to pray. She began to fast. And she began to 
make a vow unto the Lord. Now listen to me very carefully here. She had a pressing need. The first thing I want you to write down is this, a pressing need and a pressing desire will always cause you to press into fasting. Let me say it again. A pressing situation, a pressing need, a pressing desire will always cause us, me and you, to press into, to press into fasting. Are you listening to me? You see, a lot of people say they have a desire. Lord, I want this. Lord, I want that. But they never fast for it. Well, if you, if your desire does not press you into fasting, then my friends, it's only a mere wish, but it is not an ardent, intense desire. What do I mean by an intense, pressing desire? By that I mean, what I mean is that Hannah said, I got to have a baby. I've got to have a baby. I can no longer be barren. I can no longer tolerate this situation. I can no longer tolerate the mockery of Penina. I can no longer tolerate that my womb is now empty. I gotta have a baby. I gotta have a child. I've got to have a son. I've got to be fruitful. I cannot be married and not have a child. Oh, you're listening to me now? Can you say amen? That became an urgent, ardent, pressing, intense need and intense desire. And because she really wanted it, she said, praise God, I've got to have this. So she attached fasting and prayer into her life. Now, I want you to, I want to show you something here. Go with me to what uh, Jesus said uh, in the book of, uh, let's go to the book of Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, and verse 29. Mark chapter 9 and verse 29. Please, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Blessed be God. Blessed be God. Blessed be God. All right, Mark chapter 9 and verse 29. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> and you will see this same thing, same verse. Um, spoken in the book of Luke as well, okay? So Mark 29, Mark 9 and verse 29, Jesus said when the disciples asking, why is it that we could not cast this devil out? All right, so what did Jesus say? Jesus said, this kind cometh not out, but by prayer and fasting. This kind doesn't come out, but but what? Prayer and fasting. Everybody say uh, prayer and fasting. Say it again. Prayer and fasting. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, <clears throat> let's go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17 and 21. Matthew 17 and 21, please. Very important you get this verse. Uh, and I want to read it to you from a different version as well, please. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. All right. Matthew 17. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And <clears throat> we are going to read. What did I say here? Verse. <clears throat> verse 21. Well, no, no, I want, to, I want to look for that scripture in the book of Luke. Thank you, Jesus. When Jesus said, uh, this kind cometh not out. This kind, let me find this for you right now. This kind cometh. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This kind cometh. 
Praise be to Jesus. And when we read to the, the NIV, Mark 9, 20, Mark 9, 29, this kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. Thank you, Lord. But then the ESV version says, this type can only, will never come out, will never come out except by prayer and fasting. This kind will never come out. So there are some things that will never leave your life until you learn to fast and to pray. And there are some things that will never come into your life until you learn to fast and pray. I want you to put your hand on your heart and sit up with me, please. There are some things that will never leave my life. Come on, sit with me, please. There are some things that will never leave my life until what? Praise God, until you learn to fast and pray. And there are some things that will never come into your life until you learn to fast and pray. Now, <clears throat> in Luke chapter 2 and verse 37, we see another woman by the name of Anna. All right. And she was a widow, verse 37, of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Now, for 84 years she did this, okay? She did this for a number of years because she was praying through the coming of Jesus. She had a desire to see the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so I'm talking to you today about the indisputable power of fasting and prayer. I want you to write this down now. Fasting is you saying to God, I mean serious business with this. This is not just a mere wish. This is this is the real McCoy. This is, I mean business with this. I want this to occur in my life. See, many of us don't have that kind of intense desire. Well, I'd just like to have that. Well, I'd, if the Lord wants to bless me one day with a house, he'll bless me. No, 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 no. If your desire does not push you to prayer, and to fasting, then it's just, it is just a wish. Oh, I'd, li I'd like to have more anointing. Oh, I'd like to have more glory in my life. Oh, I would like to see this happening in my church. If it does not press you into fasting and into prayer, ladies and gentlemen, then all that you have is just a mere wish. Are you listening? Because a real intense and ardent desire will cause you to put some actions to your desire. Can you say amen? Praise God. Now, write this down as well. Fasting is removing yourself publicly from man and from food for private dealing with God. Let me say it again. Fasting is removing yourself publicly from man and from food for private dealing with God. Private dealings with God. Write this down as well, please. Fasting is abstaining from physical food in order to eat spiritual food. Fasting is abstaining from physical food in order to just eat or to partake of spiritual food. Now, what is spiritual food? The word of the living God. Praise God. All right. Now, so since we are talking about the indisputable power of fasting and prayer, and by prayer, did you notice the Bible said we read in your Bible? You read in your Bible. She continued praying. She continued praying. So what are we talking about here? What we're talking about here is intercessory prayer. Everybody say with me, intercessory prayer. So we're talking about the indisputable force, the indisputable power of fasting and prayer. Very important for you to understand that. Now, remember what I said to you. A pressing need, a pressing desire will always press you to fast. Now, what is intercessory prayer? Listen to me very carefully here. Romans chapter 8 Verse 26 to verse 28 gives us the best definition of what intercessory prayer is. And then you're going to write something, ladies and gentlemen, that I want you to write down. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, 
the Spirit, who? The Holy Spirit helps our infirmities. For we know not, we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession. Who makes intercession? The Holy Spirit within you. What is he interceding? His intercessory prowess and prayer goes up to heaven from the earth, from within you, and connects with the intercessory prayer of our high priest, Jesus Christ. Because what is Jesus doing right now in heaven? Right now in heaven, the Bible tells you, he's at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. Making intercession for you. So therefore, intercessory prayer, now won't you write this down? All right, I'm about, I'm about to drop the mic on you. Write this down, please. Intercessory prayer is the divine in us appealing to the divine above us. Just drop the mic on you. You ain't never heard that before? Now you heard it. Okay. I want you please to write this down. Intercessory prayer is the divine in us. Who is the divine in us? It's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit in us, appealing to the divine above us. Who is the divine above us? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It is uh, our great high priest, glory to God, our heavenly intercessor, praying to the Father for us. And so if the divine in us, if the Holy Spirit inside of us begin to pray through, and how does he do that? He does that through the avenue of tongues. He does that through the avenue of praying in the Spirit. He does that through the avenue of prayer. Glory to God. Can you say amen? So let me say it again. Intercessory prayer. Everybody repeat it after me. Amen. We just dropped the mic on you today. Glory to God. Intercessory prayer is the divine in us. Who is that? The Holy Spirit appealing to the divine above us. Who is that? Jesus. This is why in the Bible, you will see that people who really wanted something from God, they went on a fasting and prayer marathon. I want you please to write this down in your notes. A fasting and prayer marathon. Moses went on a prayer marathon. Daniel went on a prayer marathon. The Apostle Paul went on a prayer marathon. Hannah went on a prayer marathon. Jesus went on a prayer and fasting marathon. God's people, Israel, went on a fasting and prayer marathon for 70 years. Glory to God. Can you say amen? So I'm going to show you this. This is why you need to learn to fast and to pray. Now, let's quickly define to you what fasting is. Because it's only in the modern church that they want to change it. They want to redefine what fasting is. Fasting, I want you to write this down, is the Hebrew word Som, T-S-O-M. The T is silent, okay? So fasting in Hebrew is T-S-O-M, Som, and it means to close the mouth, to close the mouth. Why do you close the mouth? So that no food can go into that mouth of yours. No Big Mac. No double cheeseburger. No Whopper meal. Okay? Because the word fasting, som, means to close the mouth. All right? Now, <clears throat> in the Greek, that was the Hebrew, in the Greek, you've got two words for the word fasting. One be the word nes. Nesteia, N-E-S-T-E-I-A. All right, it's a combination of two words, ne, steia, which means, ne means no, steia means food. So what does the word fasting mean? No food, no food. All right, then you've got another word, another word for the word fasting in Greek, and that's the word 
Asitos, A-S-I-T-O-S, Asitos. What does the word Asitos mean? It means no corn, no food, literally means no corn. So we can see that the Bible, the biblical definition of fasting is to abstain from food on some kind of level. All right? It has to do with a restriction of food coming into your mouth. And the reason why we have to stress that, we have to specify that, because today a lot of people will tell you, well, fasting means you don't read the newspaper. Fasting means you don't go on social media. Fasting means you don't go on, on, on Facebook. That is not fasting. All right? You may, you may consider it as fasting, all right, but that is not a biblical fast. When Moses fasted, he did not abstain from newspaper. When Jesus was fasting, are you listening? He didn't say, well, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm staying away from Facebook. No, 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 no. Fasting means to abstain from food. Pure and simple. Now, there are different levels of restriction. There are different types of fasts in the Bible. You have a normal fast. A normal fast is when you are healthy and you abstain from solid, but you partake of liquid, water. You should always drink a lot when you are fasting. All right? You should always drink a lot when you are fasting. Then you've got what is known as a, that was a normal fast. Then you've got what is known as a partial fast or can also be known as a Daniel fast, when you abstain from meat and sweets, all right, and you only eat vegetables, all right, and you drink a lot of water. Daniel did that. Are you listening? Especially because he was working in the uh, <clears throat> um, in the government um, corridors. So he had to be able to think straight. So he did not partake of meat. He did not partake of uh, of sweets. But he only partook of of uh, bread and vegetables. Are you listening? Others can take uh, didn't have to take bread. All right. Are you listening to me, somebody? Can you say amen? So that's what you call a partial fast. And then you have what is known as a total fast. A total fast is when you do not drink any liquid and you do not drink any solid for three solid days. Three solid days. All right? But God is so gracious to us that he allows you to, to, he allows you to decide your level of intensity of fasting. Are you listening? If all you can do is 9 to 12, go ahead, do that. If all you can do is just uh, abstain from meat, okay, and only eat vegetables, salad, that's fine. All right, God looks at your heart. Are you listening to me now? But it has to do with some kind of restriction of food. It has nothing to do with the phone. Now, it's good that you get away from phone. It's good that you get away from Facebook. But that is not the <clears throat> that is not what fasting biblically means. Okay, thank you, Lord. So it has to do with some level of food restriction. Let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter twenty-four. All right, we're going to look at uh, uh, people's fasting and prayer marathon. And then we'll, we'll explain this to you real quickly. Exodus chapter 24, verse 15 to verse 18. And Moses went up into the mount, and the cloud covered the mount. Glory to God. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. That's the glory. And the seventh day he called unto Moses. Praise the Lord. Can you say thank you, Lord Jesus? All right, he called unto the Lord. <clears throat> God called him out of the midst of the clouds. Verse 17, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Verse 18, and Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was there in the mountain with God for 40 days and 40 nights. So Moses was there on a prayer, on a fasting and prayer marathon for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, if you have never fasted for one day, don't even try to fast for 40 days. You will not last. 
you will not last. Well, bless God, Moses did it. I can do it. Yeah, Moses was in the holy mount with God. You by you are by yourself, all right, in Louisville. There's no holy mountain in Louisville. There's no holy mountain in Mauritius. There's no holy mountain in London. There's no holy mountain in Paris. Moses was on the holy mount with God. All right, so let's 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 go through and let me show you right now the different people that had intense desire and they went on a fasting and prayer marathon. All right, glory to God. Again, remember this: if you haven't fasted, don't jump into it. Learn to fast small. Learn to fast what? Small. And then begin to build from that. Okay. Let's go. Let's look at Moses. Exodus chapter 34. We're going to read verse 28 till verse 30. Exodus chapter 34, verse 28 till verse 30. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. See, he was in a total fast, but he was in the glory cloud. Okay, he was with the Lord. When you're with the Lord, you don't need anything. Okay? And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenants, the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hands, when he came down from the mount, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face was shining while he talked, uh, <clears throat> while he talked with him. And Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses. Behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him because the glory was on his face. The glory was on his face. So we see here that Moses had a 40-day fasting and prayer marathon. You can't do that right now. Okay? Hallelujah. Number two. The second person who had a fasting and prayer marathon. Daniel. Daniel was an old man in his 80s at that time. Okay? Daniel had a 21-day fasting and prayer marathon to clear the spirit world, to clear the realm of the spirit because his prayers was being hindered by the prince of, uh, by the prince of Persia. Okay? Daniel chapter 10 Verse 2, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. That's 21 days. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So Daniel was on a marathon of fasting and prayer for 21 days because he needed some answers. And because he was working in the government corridors, uh, all right, he still had to function. He couldn't faint in public. So he abstained from meat. Are you listening? And he abstained from sweets. And he abstains from from um, pleasant bread. He only ate vegetables. Are you listening? For, and pulse, for three weeks. Three weeks. And, and, and attached to his prayer, to his fasting, was intercessory prayer. And he cleared the realm of the spirit so that his answers can manifest. Paul had a 14-day fasting and prayer marathon to escape the death threat of a shipwreck. Let me say it again. Paul, the apostle Paul, had a 14 days fasting and prayer marathon to escape the death threat of a shipwreck. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 27, verse 33. Acts chapter 27 and verse 33. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the 14th day that you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. 14 days. In a shipwreck, they fasted. Paul fasted, and an angel appeared to him. All right, praise God. Wherefore, I pray unto you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. Are you listening? So Paul went on a 14-day uh, fasting and prayer marathon. Number four, I want you to write this down. 
Now, before Daniel ever went on a 21-day fast in his 80s, did you know that Daniel had a three-year, how many years? Three years fasting and prayer marathon and emerged as 10 times with more wisdom. Now, where do we get that? Daniel chapter 1, verse 5. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 5. And the king appointed unto them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. So nourishing them for three years, that at the end of the that thereof that they might stand before the king. Now come down to verse 8. They were on a three-year program. They will eat the king's meat and drink the king's wine. And the king's meat was given to idols. And so Daniel, verse 8 says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Why? Because the king's meat was given to idols, was an offering to idols that they were given to the to this man. All right. Know the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He didn't want to eat that. Are you listening? So he said to the guy, listen, give me 10 days and you will see my face after 10 days that I will be better looking, better in better shape than this guy's eating the king's meat. After 10 days, he looked better. And so what happened? They allow him, amen. They allow him to go on a three day, amen, not eating any meat. All right, verse 18. Now at the end of the days, how many years was that? Three years. That the king had said that he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 19 and 20. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all, look at this now, and in all the matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better, ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Why? Because they stayed in the spirit of fasting, in the attitude of fasting. They did not take of the king's idol meat. Are you listening? No, of the wine of the king. But they just ate vegetables, praise God, pulse, lentils, and so forth and so on. All right? so as not to defile themselves. Can you say amen? All right, praise God. And then after three years, they had 10 times more wisdom. All right, number five, Anna the prophetess, all right, had a an 84 fasting and prayer, 84 years fasting and prayer marathon until Jesus was born and manifested in the flesh. Look in your Bible, please. Luke chapter 2, verse 36 to verse 38. It said, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of four score. Four score, a score is 20. Four score, so four times 20 is 80 and four years, 84 years, she departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day, night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, speaking of him to all them that look for redemption in Jerusalem. Can you say amen? Glory to God. Let me read that to you from the Passion Translation, verse 36 to verse 37 from the Passion Translation. A prophetess named Anna was also in the temple. In the temple called that day, she was from the tribe of Asher and the daughter of Phanuel. Anna was an aged widow who had been married only seven years before her husband passed away. After she died, she chose to worship God in the, tw in the temple continually. For the past 84 years, she had been serving God with night and day prayer and fasting. That's what you call dedication. That's what you call dedication. Number six. Number six. You will see 
that God's people, when they were in captivity, how long were they in captivity? 70 years. All right. And for 70 years, without fail, at a certain point, they, uh, certain months, they fasted and they prayed. So Judah had a 70 years fasting and praying marathon to come out of captivity. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 4 and verse 5. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth, in the seventh month, right, in the fifth and the seventh month, even though 70 years did you at all fast unto me, even to me. So we can see here that in the fifth and the seventh month, for 70 years, Israel allocated these months as times of fasting and prayer. So they were on a fasting and prayer marathon for 70 years. Are you listening to me now? Number seven, please. Look in your Bible. Jesus was on a fasting and prayer marathon before launching into the fullness of his ministry. Luke chapter 4, we're going to read verse 1 and 2. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, returned of Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tested by the devil. And in those days, uh, he ate nothing. He ate nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward was hungry. All right, verse 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Okay, so you can see I've shown you different examples of people having fasting and prayer marathon. Now, what is a marathon? A marathon, ladies and gentlemen, is a time-consuming activity that requires a lot of energy and a lot of determination. Okay? A marathon is a long-distance race that goes up and down, bending to the left, bending to the right, that requires stamina and mental preparation when hitting the lows, the depth, and the highs in order to cross the finishing line. Let me say it again. A marathon is a long-distance race that goes up and down, bending to the left, bending to the right, that requires physical stamina and mental preparation when hitting the lows and the depth and the highs in order to cross the finishing line. That is a regular definition of what a marathon is in the natural. So what is a fasting and prayer marathon? Okay, a fasting and prayer marathon is a type of spiritual activity that takes a long time to complete. Okay? It takes a long time to complete. Now, write this down, please. I want you to write this down. <clears throat> I want you to write this down. Fasting and prayer marathon is only practice for those who have a deep hunger for God. A fasting and prayer marathon is only practice or indulge, for lack of a better word, or engage by those who have a deep hunger for God. Write this down, please. Fasting and prayer marathon is only engage, practice, and indulge by those who have desperate needs, pressing needs, are you listening? Like Daniel, like Hannah, right? Like the Apostle Paul. So fasting and prayer marathon is only engaged by people, only practiced by people who are desperate and have desperate needs. All right? <clears throat> Write this down. Fasting and prayer marathon is only engaged by people, practiced by people who have spiritual, mental, and physical stamina. You got to have spiritual, mental, physical stamina. Praise God. 
So this is why you, can, you don't just jump into a fasting and prayer marathon. You got to learn to build yourself. If you've never prayed for one hour, why are you trying to do that? You're not going to make it. You see, you have to you, you have to have someone to develop you, to develop you. Just like you have a coach that will develop you, you need a praying coach, a fasting coach. Okay? All right. Fasting and prayer marathon is only engaged, practiced by people who are desperate for a move of God. Fasting and prayer marathon is only practiced and engaged by those who are desperate for a move of God. Next, write this down. Fasting and prayer marathon is only engaged by people and practiced by those who are purpose-driven, purpose-oriented, destiny-driven. I've got to see my destiny. I've got to see my life unfolded before me. God, what you said in this book about me must become a reality. Can you say amen? All right. Fasting and a prayer marathon is only practiced and gauged by those who want to live a life free of defilement from the world. Free for, of defilement from the world. Okay? So if you want a free uh, defilement, free from defilement lifestyle, meaning close to God, then you will want to develop what we call a fasting and prayer marathon. Can you say amen? Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right, praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, Jesus, all right, Moses, Elijah, Daniel, and Paul, to name a few, participated in a spiritual marathon, fasting and prayer marathon, that brought maturity, ministry, and miracles that brought what maturity ministry and miracles well what are the effects of a fasting and prayer marathon what are the effects well Moses came down with two tablets unveiling God's laws Moses face shone with the glory of God Daniel was ten times wiser, and had unlimited promotions in several administrations. Paul escaped the death of from a shipwreck and saved the lives of those that were with him, 276. Daniel dissolved doubts. Anna, amen, gave birth, Hannah gave birth to Samuel, and then Anna in the New Testament gave birth to the, to the promise of God. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit, glory to God, and dominated the atmosphere. Now, so, so this is why we've got to learn the indisputable power of fasting and prayer. Your church should be teaching you how to fast and how to pray should be leading you, teaching you, training you to fast and to pray. Those people who fast and pray, nothing is impossible for them. Those who pray, those who fast and pray, they will live in the realm of no impossibilities. You hear me now? Thanks for listening to this episode of the Faith Lift Radio Podcast. For more information about Dr. Glenn and how to offer your financial support, log on to glennarecchion.org.